Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 126 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest will be Ricardo Almeida, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but let's start with our quote. Actually, before we get to the quote, I just want to quickly say that if you're enjoying the show, please like us on Facebook if you haven't done so already, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Subscribe on iTunes or YouTube and go ahead and rate us on iTunes if you get a moment. would really appreciate that. It would mean a lot to me, so thank you. All right, our quote for today is, At first, repetition is what counts. I teach my students to repeat the moves to exhaustion until it enters their subconscious, and they therefore can apply them automatically without thinking. Later on, once the combat situations have become complex... I try and stimulate them to be creative. And that's from Master Carlos Gracie Jr. Okay, Ricardo Almeida has been practicing and teaching jiu-jitsu for over 20 years. He's competed all over the world and coached at the highest levels. He's a Henzo Gracie black belt, and he's a UFC pride and pancreas veteran. He's won multiple titles in Brazil, won the Jiu-Jitsu Pan American Championships, and was also a two-time silver medalist at the Abu Dhabi Combat Submission World Championships. He's coached a number of MMA and UFC fighters, such as Frankie Edgar, and helped them be the best they can be through his coaching. He's also the founder of Ricardo Almeida Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy, and he's had a huge impact throughout the world through his fighting, coaching, and teaching. In this interview, we cover a number of very interesting topics, including the power of jiu-jitsu in people's lives, how to get through this current self-isolation situation, growing up with his brothers Flavio and Andre in the early days in Brazil, and competition between schools, matches that stand out, Carlos Gracie Jr.'s impact on him, fighting MMA in Pride FC and the UFC, who he thinks are the best American jiu-jitsu guys currently out there, and the best jiu-jitsu guys in MMA. He talks about being an MMA judge and the challenges that brings, being a father and how jiu-jitsu helps kids with autism and kids in general, his relationship with Master Henzo Gracie, and the impact it's had on his jiu-jitsu and his life, training as you get older, and a number of other things. So I know you're going to enjoy this interview. After the interview, make sure you stick around for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now without further ado, let's talk to Ricardo. All right, I'm speaking with Professor Ricardo Almeida, Henzo Gracie Black Belt, retired UFC and Pride Fighter, and founder of Ricardo Almeida BJJ Academy. So welcome, Ricardo, and thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. No, man, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, it's totally my honor. There's uh, there's a lot of different things I want to speak with you about. Uh, you're such an interesting uh, person, but I think it'd be good to start with the power of jiu-jitsu and uh, something I read on your website was jiu-jitsu has changed my life and I want to be able to share the gentle art with as many people as possible through jiu-jitsu I've seen fathers get in the best shape of their lives kids overcome bullying moms learn to walk confidently down the street knowing they have the knowledge to stay safe and my own son Henzo who was diagnosed with autism in 2008 
overcome sensory and social issues related to his diagnosis and in 2015 be recommended for general education math classes. So there's so much in this statement that speaks to the power of jiu-jitsu. So Ricardo, can you elaborate on this and what you've seen jiu-jitsu do in people's lives? Yeah, I think that jiu-jitsu is, the, is a perfect vehicle to allow us like individually to just explore like what we're capable of, you know? Like I think that a lot of us just walk through life and for one reason or another, maybe it's someone in your childhood or maybe it's just part of your personality or, or, or maybe it was a, a circumstance in your life that, you know, tells you that, you know, you can't do it or, you know, you're not good enough or you're not fast enough. You're not this and you're not that. And no matter who it is from, you know, the little kid that was bullied from, from the parent that used to be maybe a college athlete that's now in the worst shape of his life, you know, through the mom that, you know, the single mom that's scared and, you know, sits at home at night thinking how she's going to do this. Uh, no matter who it is and no matter what time of their lives they find jiu-jitsu, they are going to find a much better version of themselves through the practice of jiu-jitsu, you know. Like I've seen it, uh, I've seen it for my son, I've seen it for my students, I've seen it for myself, you know, like, and, and because I've been doing this for so long, Right. There are times that I'm training harder and maybe other times I'm being a little lazier or other times I am injured, you know, like and I've I've understood now that no matter what, the times that I am most focused on my training, those are the times that I am being the best version of myself. Like I start training harder, maybe I'll sign up for no gi pen ends and I'll start focusing on my training. Next thing you know, you know, my attention to detail when I'm teaching is higher, you know, like my Maybe my patience is a little higher, or maybe if, if uh, as a de- as a parent, or maybe if I need to be a little harder on the kids and 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 be a little bit more strict, or a little more consistent as a father, then I am able to do that. You know, also in my personal relationship with my girlfriend, like I I feel that when we're really focused on our training, that expands into other every area of our life. You know, well but. Said. Just to the beginning, you know, going back to the beginning, like no matter no matter who you are, uh, we all have like a fear of something, you know, like and, and that fear keeps us from doing certain things. And and I really believe that with and through jujitsu, through the practice, right, through hard practice, right, like you, you're able to find that like fear is just holding you back, that it's OK to have fear. It's a part of attempting anything, you know, out of the ordinary. But. Like fear is just there to hold you back from from reaching your full potential as a person, no matter what it is that you're trying to do. And I think jiu-jitsu is perfectly, perfectly balanced because it's a perfect balance between nurture and nature, you know, like, and uh, it's Darwinism, but there's also like a lot of nurture uh, into it. So I think it's the perfect practice from the little kid all the way through, you know, parents and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, uh, the nature nurture. I've, I've never heard jujitsu uh, spoke about in those terms. I really love that. I, yeah, I consider it the ultimate empowerment vehicle. So like you said, no matter who you are, where you're coming from, and your background and your situation, it, it has something for all of us to really be empowered and move past fear. And it's even more refreshing hearing that from someone who's you know, been at the top of all the competitive games. And to be able to still have that all-encompassing jujitsu is for everybody attitude. Uh, right now, it's a very uncertain time, you know, with so many of us who love jiu-jitsu not being able to practice it as much as we would like, or at least the way we would like, maybe go to the academy because of, you know, the the uh, self-isolation thing. So what thoughts or advice do you have for people out there just really getting antsy? Their lives have been turned up by our current situation, but uh, they still want to be doing jiu-jitsu. And, you know, what thoughts do you have on that? Well, I think, first of all, uh, let's just, you know, start with the you know facing the harsh reality that right now we can't practice jiu-jitsu right like we're not supposed to be getting together in groups so we're not supposed to be you know that close to each other you know and and, and who knows when that's going to open up right so i've i've started with, from that premise when i've when i've thought about my role as an instructor during these times you know and so how what can we do now that makes us better at jujitsu, right? Like, cause my students came to me and, you know, I, I somehow end up giving advice about other things besides jujitsu, although I try really hard not to. 
you know, like my expertise is jujitsu and, and, and nothing else. So I try not to give advice on anything else. You see guys now all of a sudden, you see a lot of these jujitsu guys that have become epi epidemiologists and, you know, financial advisors. And I try not to give advice outside of jujitsu, right. you know. But I really feel like as a, as, a, as a whole, right, like when I look at, you know, my school and I look into most schools and, 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 and I look at just the jiu-jitsu population as a whole, I think we've, we all could be a little more athletic, right? Like being a little bit better shape, being, being, you know, focused on areas that normally we don't focus on because jiu-jitsu is so powerful, right? Like you could take a... You could take the problem of, all right, escaping side mount, and you could just solve that, which is so hard, with just a simple bridge and a hip escape, which is totally technical, although there's a little bit of, you know, strength involved in it, you know. But everyone wishes they could be better. No matter how good you are, you always wish you could be better. You always wish that you could beat this guy and that guy and the other guy, whether, whether that's at your own academy or all the way up to the world championships, or all the way up into a UFC title, right? Like, and jujitsu at the highest level, there is a certain element of intensity that's required, and that intensity at moments is strength, at certain other moments is endurance, at other moments it's you know it's activity and and like isometric holds, but there is a very big physical element that's totally trainable. Uh, for jiu-jitsu at the highest level, I really believe. Mm -hmm. You know, like even when you take a guy like uh, like Gordon Ryan as an example, like yes, he's a he's a freaking Jedi with you know that no gi game, you know, with the back takes, with the leg locks, and with the sweeps, and you know his passing is unbelievable. But I remember Gordon when he was a, a purple belt, and this kid was doing iron crosses. You know, he had rings in his house, and he was like, he was like an athletic freak before <laughs> his technique even became any good you know he, he like he sucked he didn't really suck but like he was just a purple belt like yeah. a tough purple belt and this kid is doing like iron cross he's doing stuff that gymnasts have a hard time doing you know wow. so of yeah. course by the time his technique evolves he becomes this unstoppable force because he has a level of intensity and a refinement in his technique that when you put those two together it's it's just you know now we're seeing the 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 full product right, but for everyone out there that's now stuck at home like I my advice is like hey man like this is this is like a training camp, and you're spending two weeks four weeks six weeks however long it takes just preparing yourself to train jujitsu, you know and and you know focusing on developing like a little bit better like aerobic base right like there's a lot of people in a jiu-jitsu school that can't do a five-minute round without opening their mouth and, you know, feeling like they're going to have a heart attack. Right. There's a lot of people like that, you know, and, and building a little aerobic base is going to go a long way, not only for their jiu-jitsu, but also for their overall health, you know. And on top of the aerobic base, maybe you build some strength, but not just pure strength, just strength and muscle endurance, right, like the ability to explode repetitively uh, over like a certain long period of time, whether it's a five minute round, a 10 minute round, or you know, no time limit round, like that you're not dead after you explode for a couple of times, right? Like my two kids, they're, they run, and they just got done with a state championships uh, for winter track, just before this whole thing happened. And they both have times that most of us regular people that don't run, like cannot do. Like, my son did two miles in less than 10 minutes, you know? Like, it's, it's crazy. This is running, like, so fast. I brought him and my daughter to jiu-jitsu, like, the week after. And, you know, they missed jiu-jitsu. They were so focused on their running. And they jumped on the mats. And, you know, my daughter goes, like, come on, let's roll, let's roll, let's roll. And it was literally two minutes later. They break up. And they both have their hands hanging down on their knees. And they have half their tongue <laughs> sticking out of their mouth. Because they have that cardio, crazy cardio, not like superhuman cardio. Like my son goes out on 90 minute runs at, you know, nine miles an hour, but they don't have that muscle endurance, right? right. So I think that's a second element that I think it's so important for training, you know, and that's very sports specific. That's where doing stuff that's specific to jujitsu and maybe not just going to some strength guy that thinks that if you bench press, if now you bench press 150 pounds, 
by the time you bench press 400 pounds, you're going to be two and a half times as good as what you are now, right? Like a lot of it is specific to jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so like not you. to extend myself, I really believe that right now everyone who is dying to be better at jiu-jitsu who is dying to train, man, build your cardio base, build your strength and muscle endurance. Maybe some of the guys, they already have that, you know, work on some flexibility and some solo drills for some flow and, you know, work on the areas that maybe you're not as good at. And, and maybe some of you really try to try to jot down, like, what your game is like. Like, you know, what what is it that you use from side mount, from mount, from, from guard, from here, from there? And try to see, like, where you need to have a, a few more options and so on and so forth. Like, there's a lot that people could do now that will make them better. But there's also a lot of things that you could do that are not going to make you any better. Like, sitting around and doing nothing or playing video games or, or, or whatever else that people are doing to distract themselves. That's true. You know? Very true. No, great insights. Um, taking this time to work on some of the areas you aren't as strong in, some of your physical attributes and your your cardio. And like you said, sport-specific stuff is, is very important because it doesn't always translate uh, very well. And also, there are a number of people out there that have been generous enough to either provide free video stuff so you can always work on some of your technical aspects, at least you know, absorbing it through through watching. That certainly goes a long way as well. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I'm, I'm always a little skeptical about, like, learning isolated moves. Mm-hmm. Like, I always, when I've been around, like, great teachers, like, there is a very clear line of thought that they have, uh, whether it's a tactical position, such as maybe, like, a spider guard or a Delahiva guard or some type of way of passing. And I've always tried to understand how someone thinks so that I could dissect their style a little bit better and you know uh, adapt that to my game over just learning a technique here, learning a technique there, you know, like so. And and like you're saying now, there's so many guys that have you know real courses online. You know, John Danner, you know, he's brilliant and he has a ton of stuff out there. And and you know, I think everyone ought to just have a couple of his DVDs and try to understand how John thinks. You know what I mean? Like I know Bernardo Faria has a, a, a much more sport jiu-jitsu oriented game with the gi, but he had a beautiful, uh, you know, half guard to, you know, over on the pass, you know, like, and, and there's other guys like that. Gordon now has DVDs. So my recommendation is guys, instead of just, you know, looking at moves here and there, like try to try to take someone who's incredible like that and try to understand how they think because you will see jiu-jitsu in a very different way. That's a great point. It's it's real easy to be attracted to this flashy one technique video or, or this and there. Just skip around and, you know, all of a sudden you spend hours just dabbling in a lot of things instead of, like you say, kind of digging a deep hole to stay with one person in one particular area and they really go in depth about it and the logical progression with certain things. So that's really cool. Let's, let's, uh, let's change gears for a second, Ricardo, and take us all the way back. What was it like growing up with your brothers, Flavio and Andre, and, and how did you get started in jiu-jitsu? So, man, I was the first one that started jiu-jitsu. I was the oldest, you know, and when I was around like 13, 14, uh, you know, growing up in Rio, like it's, it's very different. I guess it's like here back in the day, you know, like if you grow up in any city, you know, like as a boy, there's going to be fights, there's going to be bullies, you know, there's going to be situations that you're going to be, you know, you're going to be required to handle yourself as a man, you know, like especially as you're, you're getting a little bit older. And my dad wanted me and my brother Flavio to start some type of martial arts. And he had actually done karate uh, pretty seriously when he was younger, when he was in, you know, his late teens. Like he competed in like state championships and stuff. Uh, so he was pretty serious about karate back in the day. So he took us to a karate school. And I grew up in Baja da Tijuca, you know. So I had a friend, Marcelo, that he now uh, runs Gracie Baja in Australia. But at the time, you know, we went to school, I think since just after kindergarten, we were in school together and we had, we were in our first year of high school and he, you know, we should get to school and you say, oh man, I'm doing karate. Oh, back at the time it was like the Van, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, you know, like, oh, yeah. as a kid, you're like, Ricardo, what are you doing? What are you doing this karate for me? You got to come try some jiu-jitsu and... You know, after a while, he finally talked me into it. And, you know, when I, put, when I took my first class, I was, man, like, that's it. I was hooked. I came home and I was drilling moves with my brother on the carpet. And about a year later, Flavio, Flavio started training. And it was actually Andre, so much younger than me and Flavio, that I think Andre was born, like, the same year that I started training jiu-jitsu, you know. So I was, like, 15 when uh, Andre was born. It was many, many years later that, that he started training. 
Uh, but yeah, that's kind of how we got started. And, and, you know, I went to the original Gracie Baja. Uh, you know, it was walking distance from my house. So I was just super lucky at the time. There was only four big schools in Rio. You know, it was Gracie Baja, Carlson Gracie, uh, Gracie Umaita, with Hoyler, and... I think back there it was called Master, which was Jacare School, you know, um, which now is Alliance. That's a Fabio Gurgel and those guys train. So there was only four big schools in Rio at the time. So what would you say were the biggest differences in those schools? Um, I think Gracie Baja was very unique because of Master Carlos Jr. You know, like he he is a very eccentric guy. You know, he had moved from Copacabana uh, from when Halls died, he moved from Copacabana into Baja da Tijuca, which is it's like a couple couple neighborhoods down from Copacabana. Rio is like, you know, it was cut up by mountains, so it was pretty far. And I think he was the first Gracie that maybe didn't call the school uh, by their name. You know, it was just Gracie Baja because he wanted like other members of the family to feel comfortable and train. And, and Carlinhos was always very, very, he's a great influencer of men you know like he, he he was more than just a jiu-jitsu instructor like he always influenced us on on eating healthy on on you know working out outside of jiu-jitsu or you know not drinking not getting involved in drugs and and man he created a great environment at the time like no one no one was really forced to compete and you know it was just killers on the mats at, at Gracie Baja and I can't really say um you know, the differences between the other schools, because I was never there. Like, I've never visited or been around any of the other instructors. It wasn't until much later, when I was already a black belt, that I had a chance to spend some time with Hoyler Gracie um, and Carlson Gracie and, you know, some of these guys. But at the time, growing up, they were just our enemies. I would only see those guys in competitions, you know. That, yeah. was, kind of, that was our YouTube back in the day, you know. Like, <laughs> exactly. You go to these competitions and you see what the guys from other schools were doing and it would be almost like your software update, you know, like, oh man, you see that guy was doing this, these guys from Alliance are doing that, like, we got to go back and we have to study this. Oh, that's cool. That's and we would cool. try to dissect what they were doing and be ready for it for the next competition and come up with, like, our own stuff, the Gracie behind. Not me, I was just, you know, I was just a blue belt and, you know, I didn't have a say in anything, but that's just kind of how the whole thing happened. Like, every tournament guys from different schools would come up with like new moves or, or new ways of passing the guard or takedowns and, and, and we would have to go to the next competition ready for it you know and that's that really pushed i feel the level of jiu-jitsu and that's kind of how it happens now but now it happens so much faster because there's so many competitions you know? sure, sure. sounds like that intense competition really made you guys innovate and constantly evolve yeah, absolutely. We didn't have YouTube, you know, so it was really hard to to watch. Like now, you just go on, you, you go on floor grappling, and you see like every match from you know from the past like three or four years, every match that your competitor ever had in the past few years, and you could really like be ready for what they're doing. But you know, back in the day, we didn't have that. Wow, totally a different time for sure. Uh, let's go back to um, you and your brothers. I, I know when I was um, speaking with. Flavio, he, he described you as a, a great mentor to him and just really um, talked about how much you added to his life and his childhood, especially when it came to jiu-jitsu, but other things. So what was the most adventurous thing that you uh, you and your brothers ever did to, like, together? Oh, man, like before before we got into jiu-jitsu, I don't even know, man. We were like, we, we grew up in Baja. And we were kind of like, it's hard to describe, but it was like an up-and-coming uh, suburb of Rio and you know a lot of the streets were still like unpaved and you know so we were just, we grew up free man you know climbing trees you know to go pick fruits and you know playing soccer like dirt foot on the on the streets and and getting in all sorts of trouble that you could possibly imagine like as a little kid like you could go and buy like quarter sticks of dynamite and you know you would buy like fireworks like that and we'll go into these like abandoned pieces of land and just like ex you know blow up stuff and nice. not, not that it belonged to anybody you know it right a can of, like a can of paint like a like a disposed can of paint and see how high in the sky the quarter stick would shoot the the the, the can and you know flying kites like we grew up very free it's definitely not like that in Baja anymore um but we were never really like in in 
too big of a trouble, man. Like I was lucky, like at the time, like the biggest trouble that you could get, you get in a fight, you get like in a little scuffle and you know, you go home safe. Like this is like before people started having guns and like shooting each other. Like it was, uh, it was definitely like lucky times growing up. Like we would just ride our little BMXs and just go everywhere. Like the Goonies, you know, like that's kind of like growing up. We were a little bit like that, except there was no, there was no treasure for us to find that's for sure <laughs> that's funny I, I can relate to that because where i grew up it was actually in the north part of florida in the panhandle but there's a lot of rural area and my cousins were the same age and they they lived way out in the country had like several acres of land we would just run free and do all the kind of things you're describing and it was i loved the the term you put on it free it was just a fun free uh, way to grow up man that's great yeah absolutely no 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 phone like later on the video games came and I really only play video games on like rainy days. Like most of the days, we were just out playing soccer and, and, and you know running around, and figuring out ways to get in trouble. But it was it was it was really cool. That sounds very cool. So back to your competition back in the, those old days. I'm sure you had a lot of memorable matches. What's one or two matches that just immediately comes to mind as some of your either either most challenging or your most favorite matches you had? Man, it's such a long time ago. Um, I think I had a, I had one tournament that stands to mind. Like when I started training, I was still like 15. Um, and then I started doing good in some of like the junior tournaments and, and I got my blue belt when I turned 16 and I did like a couple junior tournaments. I won the nationals, like the junior nationals, like my second year, like before I even turned one year of training or year and a half of training, I won the junior nationals as a blue belt. And because I'm a, I'm a November baby, like I will, the year that I turned 18, I had to start competing as an adult. And I was 17 and I went to compete and it was my first competition as an adult. And I had, I broke my leg playing soccer. So I didn't train for like two months and I came back, I trained a little bit. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this tournament. And I, you know, I was basically 17 competing against you know, 23, 24, 25 year olds. And I competed against this Carlson Gracie guy and Carlson was the referee at the time. And I remember just being, I, I didn't even worry so much about the guy. I was more worried about Master Carlson. Like I used to be so scared of him. <laughs> well, I was like, man, what if he like, what if he say something to me? Like, I can't say nothing back. Like I just had like all these things in my head, you know? Right. And I remember he, he grabbed my belt and he was like, you guys from Gracie Baja, you always come in with your belts untied. You know, make sure you tie your belt. So he grabbed my belt and he, you know, he tied my belt so tight. And I just remember being like so scared of him. And I ended up fighting his student and his student was very, very good. But I was like pretty athletic. And I, you know, I ended up submitting this guy with a triangle and, I, and he was like quiet. And I, I remember I, I got off the mats. I was still like super scared. I was like, man, like. I don't want him to be mad at me or something, you know? <laughs> I submitted his students, so I just run off the mats, and I try to take my uh, my belt off, and my belt won't come off. Like, it took me like a half hour to untie the knot that he tied, you oh, know? Wow. And I ended up going, you know, going all the way to the, I ended up winning the tournament. I finished, like, every match uh, in my, my first adult uh, competition. And I don't know, I think I was just so nervous that day that, like, I didn't even think too much about it. I just, you know, just... Like a beginner's luck, you know what I mean? In my first, uh, in my first adult competition, so that was a really cool event. And and having fun, I used to have this on video too, but I, I lost it like through the years. I do have some pictures still. Nice, nice. I bet that was pretty intimidating. He could be a very imposing uh, figure as well. I mean, for sure. Yeah, when you're 17, you know, like I've always, you know, respected like all the all the guys from the other schools. You know, like even though we were competitors, it's like. Man, like, you know, there's Carlson Gracie, there's, you know, Hoyler Gracie and, you know, and, you know, Saul Ribeiro and like all these guys that came before me from the other schools, even though they were like our enemies, you know, I, I had a lot of admiration for like who they were in jiu-jitsu, you know, like I wanted to be them, even though they were the enemy in a way, you know, so for sure as a 17 year old, that was scary. Wow. wow. It's good to hear the respect you had for them though. I mean, it makes it that much better to compete against people, you know, that you have admiration and respect for. Uh, so when you win, it's that much sweeter. But even if you lose, you know, you have great respect for them. So it's, it just makes the whole thing more better in, in every way. Let's talk a little bit about MMA. You um, 
As an MMA fighter, you competed in the UFC and Pride. What was the motivation that led you to get into MMA, and, and how did your experiences in the UFC and Pride compare? Yeah, to be honest, I never wanted to be a fighter. You know, I I came to the U.S. I had an opportunity. You know, I wasn't really liking what I was doing in school. I was in like in the industrial engineering, and I had a friend that was close to Hanzo, and I kind of wanted to come to the United States. Um, I don't know. It's one of those if you're, you're young and you want to see the world. You know, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to the United States. I'm gonna you know try to finish school when I'm there, and you know I'm gonna stay with Hanzo for a little bit and see what happens. And I never really wanted to fight. I was always, you know, Hanzo asked me to corner him, and I was around fighting a lot. But I just wanted to do jiu-jitsu, you know. I've always just loved jiu-jitsu. I wanted to do more ADCCs and, and you know. But there was just no world championships here when I moved, you know. Like, I remember I moved here in 97. And in 97, later in the year, I had to go back to Brazil to compete in the nationals because – like there was no competitions here in the United States, you know, so I started doing Nagas and, and doing all these things. And I was in Japan with High and Gracie, Hanzo's uh, late brother, when High and fought Sakuraba. And he asked me to go with him. So it was me, High and Luca Tala, the, the, the editor of Gracie magazine. He now has a uh, you know, Hanzo school in, in Manhattan. But we were in Japan for two weeks and High was getting ready for this fight. I actually had a chance to train with Hickson during that trip. And about like a week before the fight, uh, Alan Gores had to pull out of the fight. And and they said, oh, yeah, we're going to have to bring someone from Brazil. And I, I, at the high, I was like, hey, why don't you do it? And I was like, man, all right, if Hanzo says I'm good, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I've always been competitive. Right. Uh, so I kind of got pushed and not really pushed into it but i was like all right you know almost like on a dare you know the <laughs> i think i just wanted to see if i would do it you know and i and i would like i'm like i'm not scared of competing you know and i think it was just total not having the realization of what i was really getting myself into you know but then yeah with like a three days notice i fought in pride i won that fight and this is at the end of 2000 we come back to the united states and maybe like a month later, uh, Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta walk into Hanzo school trying to sign Hanzo to come fight in the UFC because Zufa had just purchased the UFC. And Hanzo, say, Hanzo told them, hey, man, like, you know, I have a contract with Pride, but I have these two kids here. Why don't you take these two kids? Why don't you take these two young guys? And it was me and Matt Serra. So me and Matt Serra signed with the UFC, and we had our first fight uh, on the same night. And it, to me, it was just almost like a snowball. Like I never really had, you know, being an MMA fighter was definitely never like my childhood dream or anything like that, for sure. It was just, a, you know, I've always loved competing. And to me, that was the highest level of competition that you could possibly have. It's to take the jiu-jitsu that I had learned since I was 15 and go use it in a real fight. Like to me, there was no no better expression of of competition, you know, and, and that's always how it's been to me, you know, it's been more about the competitive side than, than, you know, than what whatever, form it takes. whatever money or whatever, you know, notoriety, notoriety will come with it. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, it's interesting. You just kind of fell into it because of where you were and the natural uh, kind of evolution of the times and, and who you were with and that kind of thing. Uh, it had to be wild to be over in Japan during that time with, um, you know, I've had a few people describe how Boss Rutten was on and talking about just what a wild time it was to be over in Japan back then. So I'm sure it was. Speak to that if you want. But also, I know there are rule differences in those two organizations. But apart from that, was there anything really noticeably different in your experience in Pride and UFC? I mean, at the time, right? Like, I think at the time, Pride was a few steps above where the UFC was. You know, like I remember when Hanzo asked me and Matt to sign with the UFC, I was like, Hanzo, are you sure? You want me to sign with the UFC? Like, these guys aren't even on pay-per-view right now. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it was almost like, you know, we had senators that were against it here in the United States. Like, the UFC wasn't doing very good at that time, you know? And Pride was huge, but it was also a freak show. You know, there was, <laughs> there was no weight classes. They would take these pro wrestlers that never – threw a punch in their life and make them fight like, you know, crow cop. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how some people died, you know? And there was no drug testing. And, you know, there was nothing. It was a freak show. It wasn't, you know, a real sport. But 
there was a certain element of just raw fighting, you know, with the soccer kicks and and you know you're in Japan, the land of the samurai. Like that was that was really cool. Um, but without a doubt, you know, the UFC. Um, when I look at Pride, like the UFC is without a doubt like the evolution of the sport. You know, it's now sanctioned. You know, there's unified rules. There's there's doctors, there's, you know, athletic commissions, there, there's judges, you know, whereas back in Pride, it's like, you know, they used to put food and water out and we would never drink the food and the water because there was a chance they were going to put something in our food and water if we're fighting a Japanese opponent. You know what I mean? Like, it was just like that. It was just a whole different ballgame. That's wild. That's wild. But you've also coached a lot, uh, very successfully, uh, for MMA fighters such as Frankie Edgar and others. Who do you feel are some of the... Uh, current top american jiu-jitsu guys and how do you feel about the current level of jiu-jitsu in mma uh the current american jiu-jitsu guys in mma or just in jiu-jitsu in general just in general and then also in mma what do you feel like the current level of jiu-jitsu uh, people in mma are man i feel like for sure to me the top american grapplers are gary tonan and uh, gordon ryan you know, like, and I think that they're not only the two, the top two right now, I think they're probably like the top two ever, you know, I'm sure there'll be other ones that will come, but like, I, I, I love what Gordon and Gary do that they just kind of, they just shake up the tree a little bit, you know, like, I think that a lot of the American grapplers uh, that have come before them, you know, you have guys like Lovato, who's a beast, you know, you have uh, a kid like Keenan, who more or less same time, maybe a little bit before, more more geared towards the gi. Like they've, I feel like they've always had a little bit of this indoctrination, or them, how, however they were taught that you know Brazilians were superior. You know, like they never really truly challenged and went head to head just with the Brazilians as a whole. You know what I mean? Like whereas Gordon and Ryan. They've kicked and scratched, and you know sometimes people get upset at the way they come out. But they're like, man, like I don't care if you're from Brazil or, or from Mars. Like I'm better than you, and I'm gonna beat you. You know, like and and, and I love that. And I love they've they've had to do that to teach a lot of the younger guys coming up here in the U.S. That man, like it doesn't matter where you're from. It's how hard you work. And if you know jujitsu, you know jujitsu. It doesn't matter what your passport says. You know, and you know, I, I think that they do it pretty pretty healthy, you know, like I don't see it coming too disrespectful at all, you know, and, and but yeah, I think for sure those two guys are the two best ones. I think as far as the UFC, to me the best jiu-jitsu guy ever in the UFC is Damian Maia, you know, like I think that out of all the guys that I've seen, he's the one that's been, that had the most success doing jiu-jitsu and jiu-jitsu only. Um, but I think I have some other favorites, you know, like I think Minotaro back in the day was just so much fun to watch. Oh yeah. He was just so, he was well-rounded enough and he could take enough of a, enough of a punch so that when things hit the ground, he could submit the heavyweights and make it look so easy. Um, and you know, there, there, there's a lot of good guys out there, but for sure these that I mentioned are the ones that stick to, you know, Damien and Minotaro to me have. For sure, been my my favorites. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, exceptional exceptional grapplers. You've got a couple of fighters uh, up and coming, doing really well currently, right? Yeah, I have a couple. Of, you know, I have a couple of guys in the like in the top five, top ten. Have Frankie, uh, Eddie Alvarez, Corey Anderson. You know, Claudia Gadeira just came here, and you know, it's so much fun to work with her because she speaks Portuguese and she comes from a from a jiu-jitsu background. Uh, we have a couple of the Russians, like Zabit Magomed Sharipov. Like last year, he had the submission of the year with that crazy, with that crazy like knee bar from that like split position. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but it was so much fun. To, he's so much fun to watch. And we have a couple of Russians man, from Dagestan. They're monsters, and uh, they they just work so hard. And I think that you know you you hear a lot about some of these guys that you know some of them are not even in the UFC yet. Wow. Yeah. Definitely interested in, in following that and seeing how they they develop. Yeah, you're also a certified mixed martial arts judge, right? How'd you get into that? And what's one challenge you see that judges face in MMA judging, or maybe one thing that you'd like to see changed or improved? So I haven't judged in a long time, you know. Um, 
I did a little bit in the beginning. As soon as I retired back in 2011, 2012, 2013, like I judged a couple, you know, big UFC cards and, and Bellator, and 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 I would love to see more fighters uh, do it. And I think here in New Jersey, the commission. I was invited by the commission. I've always had a great relationship with the commission. They consulted with us fighters and coaches a lot when they created the. The amateur rules, we have a very good developmental program here in New Jersey. So the, a lot of guys from Jersey make it to the UFC. Uh, so when they invited me, I couldn't say no, you know, to come in and, you know, be the ex-fighter who's now a judge. A lot of the guys from New Jersey do train, you know, like you see like Big Dan, you know, he he's he's a beast, you know, he knows jiu-jitsu, he knows, you know, Thai boxing. There's a lot of these guys who have a training background. But man, you still have certain commissions that it's just a joke. Like some of the people that are there, like they have no idea what they're looking at. And it's unfortunate that the livelihood of certain fighters end up in the hands of some of those people. Like, I think that's like outrageous. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. And I, I don't necessarily think that only an ex fighter makes a great judge, but they have to like be a pretty serious practitioner to be able to, to judge. You know, like you can't, ju- like, the sport is evolving at such a high level, right? Like, if you even take jiu-jitsu, right? Like, sport jiu-jitsu. Man, like, if I watch, like, you know, like, a couple matches of the Meow Brothers or, like, this kid Musumichi. Like, he's also a great American. You know, talking about great American. Right? Like, this kid Musumichi. And this kid does some things that's, like, I don't know what I'm watching. And I've been my whole life around this. And I'm around this every day, all day, you know? Let Imagine what... In the UFC is the same thing. You know, these guys are developing and they're coming up with new stuff. So how do you judge if you don't know what you're looking at? And on top of that, you add the fact that you're trying to weigh weigh different aspects of fighting against each other, meaning that how do you weigh like a connected jab versus a connected leg kick or a body kick or, you know, a tightly attempted submission that your opponent really had to squirm his or her way out and when you're back to the feet the other person hits you with a punch how do you weigh that versus one another so definitely the nature of mma is a lot more obscure and a lot more a lot harder to come up with like an exact way of how to judge a fight than perhaps jujitsu is where you're measuring the same techniques versus each other but my point is unless you are involved practitioner or a coach like you have no business uh judging like that's my opinion oh man i couldn't agree with that more because like you said even someone as well versed and insightful as you you know the way the game's evolving is like wow you know what was that and you're constantly but can't imagine someone without much of a background or not being a practitioner would have any kind of insight and it's got to be super challenging like you said, with the different components, you know, years ago, if, if someone took a, did a takedown, it was pretty clear it was a takedown. So you could say this counts for however much. Now someone maybe gets a takedown, someone springs right back up. So how do you weigh that? You know, did it, did it do anything effectively? Or like you said, uh, a jab or, or a leg kick, there's so many different aspects and you've got all these different opinions in the public. Some people think these, you know, the jab should be more. Other people think the leg kick more or whatever. Or the tight submission attempt, like you said. How, how much is that worth? How long were they in it? And, and did they get saved by the round being over, etc.? There's so much to consider. But I agree with you. If you're not seriously into it, how could you do well as, as, a, as a judge? Yeah, and these guys are judging big title fights. You know, it's not like you're just taking, you know, this total uh, martial arts uh, beginner or the martial or this person who has no idea what they're looking at and they're judging maybe some local fights which still would be pretty bad right, you guys right. are judging you know on some of these commissions they're judging top fights which is which is ridiculous yeah it's, it's people's crazy. livelihood and, and and thousands and sometimes even millions of dollars at stake so it's it's crazy let's uh let's shift again ricardo i want to talk about your time kind of off the mat I know uh, some of your hobbies are surfing and, and uh, mountain biking and that kind of thing. But one thing that had an impact on me when I was reading your website, uh, you list who you are, uh, starting with father, then jiu-jitsu black belt, and then retired UFC pride fighter and founder of your academy. So it really stuck out that you uh, mentioned father first. I think that's beautiful. 
And I know you have a son, Henzo. We, we, we briefly uh, mentioned him earlier. Talk a little bit about him and your daughter, Flavia, and maybe share a little bit about how BJJ can help opt- autism. So my son, Henzo, was diagnosed with, um, with autism when he was five. He was barely verbal. Uh, he got incredible support from our from the local school district they really given him like a lot of love you know and he's developed into his own little person you know he he fell in love with running like two two years ago and he got pretty serious into it and you know he's had a couple a uh, couple college coaches reach out to him and just get a feel for what he's trying to do after high school you know like he's he's getting he's getting up there like it's not one of the elite kids uh in the state uh because he started so late like a lot of the kids started like in middle school but i think he has a lot of potential for running you know it's such a repetitive uh it's such a repetitive um activity unlike jiu-jitsu that's very complex right because i i had the kids start when I think they were about, Hansel was about seven years old. Like I, I never, I've always brought my kids to jujitsu, but I never insisted that they try it. And then one day they asked me, hey, dad, like we want to take a class. I'm like, all right, I wanted them to volunteer, <laughs> you know, basically, right. you know, instead of me forcing it into them. And they, tr- they, they, they started and, you know, like every kid, there's more, there's been times in, in their lives that they took it pretty seriously. There's been other times that, you know, I've had to bribe them with ice cream for them to train. And, you know, there's other times that they, they really love it. And other times they say they hate it, you know, and, and you know, their, their love and their connection with jiu-jitsu just goes back and forth, you know. But I think without a doubt, it's had an enormous impact on them. Uh, my daughter, whereas Hansel struggles with, you know, athletics and, um, and, you know, the structure of things and understanding what's, ex- what's expected out of him. Flavia is an athletic freak, you know, so anything she does, she does well. She just struggles with the hard work, which Hansel has, um, you know, in abundance. But she went to do soccer. My daughter went to do soccer, and she did amazing at soccer, partly because she's athletic, but the other part is because she took the soccer practices like the jiu-jitsu practices. When the coach was talking, she shut her mouth, she put her arms behind her back, she maintained eye contact. The coach asked her to do certain tasks. She'd go out there and she would do it, and then, you know, they will bring it back. So taking a soccer practice was so easy for her because she learned the structure of learning and going through a practice where you have to, you know, there is a warm up element. Then there's an element where your coach gives you an instruction and then you go out and you try to do this thing on your own and then your coach gives you feedback and then you improve on that. And where's my daughter? Every time the coach asks, she knew exactly what to do. Some of the other girls, you know, they're looking at the sky. The other one's playing with the, the bubble gum and the other one is looking at the shoe. And you know what I mean? Like, so that more than anything made my daughter very successful at athletics because she had learned from very early on a framework for problem solving and for, you know, being coachable. And she, they both learned that on the mats. And I see Hansel too. Hansel is like that with running. You know, running is definitely easier for him because all you have to do is just put one foot in front of the other. But he definitely struggled a lot with racing strategy, where sometimes you go out to go out too hard and and kill his legs. Like last year in cross country season, he collapsed twice just because he went out too fast trying to do whatever time that he was trying to do or trying to run with kids that were way more experienced than him. And he literally collapsed to the point that he couldn't get up. Um, But through his experience on the mats, uh, both of the kids are very, very coachable. And they are, you know, achieving a lot of success in athletics off the mats because of the things that they have learned in here in jiu-jitsu. That's wonderful, man. They they took that um, framework and that ability to problem solve and were able to apply it to other areas. That's really cool. How old are they? Uh, Hansel is 17, Flavia is 15. Nice, nice. And you have a, a beautiful uh, girlfriend? Yes, yes. We've been living together for like over five years now. Um, How did you guys meet? 
We met through jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah, what better way, right? Yeah, I went to teach. I have a, my good friend, Stan Back. Uh, he has a Hansel Gracie Academy, one of the old school Hansel guys. He had a Hansel Gracie school in uh, Western Florida. And I went to teach a seminar there. And my girlfriend, Monica, was one of the students. And we met. But we didn't really talk. You know, I was teaching the seminar. But then, like, later on, we, we started talking. And, you know, I went back to Florida and we hung out. And, yeah, you know, like. I don't have anyone in my life besides my family that I didn't meet through jiu-jitsu, man. You know, like every, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I don't know anyone outside of jiu-jitsu, and I don't want to know people outside oh, of jiu-jitsu. That's funny, man. That's yeah, funny. that's funny. Well, it's great that you have someone, uh, you know, besides your awesome kids, you know, someone sharing your your life and your passion for jiu-jitsu. It's very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about your relationship with Master Henzo. You, you mentioned him there for a while. You know, how did that start? How's it developed over the years? And what's the, the biggest impact he's had on your life? So when I started training at Gracie Baja, right, like it was a very small school <clears throat> compared to the size of the schools nowadays. But Gracie Baja only had two black belts. One was Master Carlos Gracie Jr. and the other one was Henzo, you know, Henzo Gracie. And Hansel was the idol for all of us, you know, because he was the only black belt besides our main instructor. And Carlinhos was already like a little bit older, whereas Hansel, when I think when I started training, Hansel was maybe like in his mid twenties. So he was competing, you know, he, he fought Ricardo De La Riva and I saw him beat De La Riva. Like he was, you know, he was getting all these tournaments and he would win and he had like, incredible technique and you know Hansel was just always known for being like take on all challengers fight people you know weight classes and uh, different weight classes so to us like we all just wanted to be Hansel you know like when we grew up like a lot of the the younger guys coming up inside Gracie Bar. and then Hansel moved to the United States he came to open a school here and uh, about a year later we have a very close friend, a mutual friend. Hansel was opening a second school and he needed someone to come teach at the academy. And I I was born in the U.S. when my parents were attending school. They, they did their master's at uh, Manhattan College in New York. So I have American passport, uh, although I grew up in Brazil. And it was really easy for me to come, you know. So I came, I lived at Hansel's home and man, I, like it was such special times for me, you know, Hansel lives about an hour from Manhattan. So uh, a couple of days a week, I would teach at the Philadelphia school that he opened. And then a couple of days a week, I'll, I'll take the train into New York with him and just all the conversations uh, about him growing up, about him and his family and, and his uncles and his cousins. And, and like, I learned so much about jujitsu in those train rides. Some days we drive into Hansel, Hansel, sometimes, you know, Hansel didn't want to be on time for the train. So I was like, all right, let's take the car. And uh, we would take the car in so many times, you know, just hearing him talk about, you know, his family stories and, you know, the, 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 the beginnings of jiu-jitsu. I learned so much, so much about the sport uh, by being around him. And, and I, I have to credit Hansel, you know, for, for everything that's good that's happened with me in jiu-jitsu since I moved to the United States from – from you know developing somewhat of a uh, of a teaching ability i learned everything about teaching from him from uh you know fighting and, and everything you know like i owe it all uh to hands of gracie without a doubt you know and 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 it was to have like a really really close relationship i don't see him as often you know like i hate going to new york i'm definitely not going to new york anytime soon now with the, everything that's going <laughs> yeah. on i don't hate new york i love new york i love being at henzo's i just don't like you know, all the hassle that it is for me to get into the city and all the traffic and, and, and all that. And I have, you know, I have my kids, I have my, my schools, you know, like I got the UFC guys, like I'm just super busy. Sure. Uh, but we talk pretty often, you know, we still, we still, uh, we still keep in touch, uh, even though we live not that far away, like we're, we exchange ideas and, and all the time. You know, the other day, I sent him pictures of the kids running, and he was he was he was so happy. It was so cool. Wow, what an incredible opportunity for you to have him as a friend and mentor throughout all these years, and to be able to absorb so much knowledge and and the history and the stories. And that's 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 incredible. 
Yeah, man, I have to, you know, and even coaching, right? Like I, like I learned how to coach because Hanzo went to fight in Japan and he had no corner man, right? Like he had no corner man. So as we were getting ready to fight, like Hanzo would not only be doing like all his physical training, but we'll be having these conversations about, you know, what to say um, during the fight, in between rounds, and a lot of it also at, later on as I started fighting and having Hanzo corner me, that's where I learned so much, right? Like Hanzo is, besides being an incredible human being, he is so smart. Like he thinks so fast. And some of the feedback or some of the input that he has, even between rounds, it's, uh, it's key, it's invaluable. And I learned so much about cornering and, and and what to say when to say it uh from him very cool very cool. i remember the first time i saw him um, the ufc was still pretty young and everybody all of a sudden knew about hoist and but hoist for the most part had a pretty passive style you know a lot of guard and then it was the uh, world combat championship and henzo was in that it was the first time i saw him fight and he looked like such a scrapper man i was like wow who is this guy he's amazing yeah, he had always had a very aggressive style yeah. of fighting, you know, and grappling, you know, like even, you know, we saw Hoist for the first time and it was that just kind of like, you know, old school Gracie in action style with the, you know, with the with the knee stomps and keeping the distance. Whereas Hansel, you know, there was more footwork, more boxing, more yeah. head movement, more wrestling style takedowns, you know. Like, so that that's another thing that always drew me to Hansel. One of the main things I learned from him is to – to always seek more knowledge, not just for the sake of accumulating knowledge, but there's always a better way of doing things. And, 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 and to not just seek knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? To be open for innovation, to be open to learning wrestling, you know, to be open to go to a boxing gym and learn how to box. And, and there was one fight that Hansel fought this guy that he leg kicked him so many times because he went to a Muay Thai coach and he learned how to, you know, how to, how to kick Muay Thai. Back then, guys weren't doing this. Like, now everyone trains everything, but back sure then, right. people would just do one discipline, you know? It's true. It's true. Well, awesome. We kind of, we could talk about him all day. Before yeah. we close, Ricardo, I, I noticed on your Facebook a post about a 70-year-old student you had. So I think that's awesome. Uh, what thoughts or advice do you have for people that are getting older and they either want to start jujitsu or are already in jujitsu, but getting older and, and start kind of questioning if they're going to be able to stay on the mats. What, what thoughts do you have for them? And I think that getting older is a lot of times like resetting expectations, you know, um, even for myself, like it doesn't matter how hard I train right now, I'm never going to be as fast, as strong as well conditioned as I once was. But I do think that my technique is getting better, uh, quite a bit actually, every time I'm super disciplined with my training. You know, for someone who, you know, is beyond like their 60s and to be able to train, I think that just being here, being around the energy of a jiu-jitsu class and being able to go through the warm-up routine, be able to drill the moves, even if in the beginning the live portion of training is a little bit hard uh you get you gain so much i think a lot of people get lost in the performance expectation of rolling right like that they think that they have to to be the best guy in the room or they think that they have to be able to keep up with this guy or that guy um whereas if you think about jiu-jitsu in terms of time right like i just want to be able to put in this amount of time on the mats, right? Like, like on Sunday, Sundays is my, Sunday is my, my slow roll day. Like I come in and I try to do over 60 minutes of rolling. It doesn't matter how much, how many times I tapped or how many times I tapped someone. Of course, someone passes my guard. I'm going to be going crazy later, like trying to figure out what happened, but it's about time. And I know that that time that I spend on the mats like it comes back to me in the form of health, in the form of uh, stress relief, in the form of uh, of just overall well-being. And when you think of that aspect of, you know, all right, I'm going to spend this time on the mats. Some of it's going to be easy. Some of it's going to be really hard. But if I, if I do develop the discipline, 
like my my physical well-being is gonna be so much higher than possibly anything else that I could do. So and and I, I think a lot of it is individually each school, you know, like for me, anyone that walks through my door, I want to be able to have them on the mats, no matter how. Like I have no, I have zero performance expectations of them when they first walk onto the mats. And then if they show that they could do it, that they can handle it, even I'm not sure like which one of the posts are. I have two guys that are like a little bit older. One is my good friend Steve, who's in incredible shape. He runs a Krav Maga school in New York. And then there's another guy. And, you know, if he starts like, you know, skipping around, I'm like, yo, hey, man, like, come on. Like, you know, you got to do this, you know. And some days he comes in and he's he's struggling a little bit because we didn't sleep well or, you know, we, had, we adjust and we adapt. But I do think that I do see in the future even classes that are for the older guys. You know, in our, in our Pennsylvania location, we have a, uh, I think it's a 30 and over class. Where you know it's the forty the forty year old guys like they don't want to come in in the morning and be used as by the twenty year old guys to get they are getting ready for competition you know they kind of do like their training a little bit on their own and I think that in the future for some of the bigger schools we're gonna see a lot more of that like the like the masters jujitsu classes you know right I think that's cool. I mean, there's so many different things in jiu-jitsu. There's the, you know, the, the hardcore competitors that people want to go meet world champions. There's, there's people that just want to do get in better shape. There's people that want to use it for a vehicle for self-growth and betterment. And all those are admirable and legitimate. And in keeping with that, you're a co-founder and advisor to the United Grapplers Association, which I think is the first and only family-oriented grappling organization focused on kids and recreational competitors. Uh, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, man, you know, we had the opportunity to put a couple of guys together and do some tournaments, you know, like I, I wanted to facilitate an environment where our, our students that want to compete, but they're not necessarily ready to go to a IBJJF competition, right? Like, and f- that they have like a little environment to go to. And because it's the East Coast, there's not that many IBJJF competitions here. So I want also a platform for my really good guys to be able to compete more often. So we have a lot of the, the tough guys doing super fights. You know, we had Gordon back in the day when he was a purple belt and brown belt doing super fights. We had Gary doing super fights. We've had, we had some pretty sick matches, actually. We had Paulo Miao versus Nicky Ryan doing super fights. So we had the super fights for the guys that are at the highest level to keep busy. We even had like super fights for the teenagers, right? Like those orange belts, green belts that are killers. You can't put them in a regular division with the little kids that train twice a week, you know? So you put them in super fights. And then our adults that are more recreational had, you know, a level of competition that it's a little bit more appropriate to, to, their, to, their, um, to their level of proficiency, you know? Same thing with the kids. So the idea for the UGA was to be that, you know, to be – to be a family oriented, like everyone could be a part of it, but to have also the super fight where the guys were really good, really tough to also be able to compete in between IBJF competitions or any other one of these big competitions. And, and it was awesome, man. I even did a super fight one time. Uh, Tom the Blast did a super fight. Like we had, we've had like the, you know, the Paulo Miao, like we, we had the who's who up here on the East Coast competing on our event, so it's been uh, it's been awesome to see all the way up down to like little 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 kids that could barely tie their belts. That's great, man. I th- I admire that. I think that's something that's certainly needed and useful for a lot of a lot of different people. Well, Ricardo, I want to thank you so much for your time, man. You're a true class act, and and thank you for letting us get to know more about you and your life. You're truly a, a legend in jiu-jitsu, and you've touched so many lives. I really appreciate you uh, giving me your time and, and sharing with us. No, man, it's great. You know, and, and your questions, especially at a time like this, they make, me, they make me think, and they also make me reinforce my convictions about how much I love jiu-jitsu and that I know that this time is temporary and that soon we're all going to be back uh, doing what we love. That's right. Keep the faith, right? Sir. All right. A long, healthy, and happy life, my friend. You too. Thank you. All right. Really enjoyed that interview with Ricardo. What a really interesting, interesting person he is, and what a great life he's had with jiu-jitsu throughout the years. 
All right. If you haven't checked out the Breathing for BJJ program, I urge you to do that today. The Breathing for BJJ program is a program that's going to help take your breathing to the next level and beyond. It's guaranteed to increase your functional capacity to breathe. It's going to help you regulate your breathing while on the mat rolling or training, as well as help you create more comfort in very difficult and smothering positions where it's hard to breathe. It helps you make peace with those and actually thrive in those positions. The program is based on the work of breathing pioneer Dr. Belisa Vranich, author of Breathing for Warriors, and it also has insights from high-level jiu-jitsu people like Salo Hibero, Pedro Sauer, Henry Akins, and Greg Nelson. You can find out more at www.breathingforbjj.com. So check it out. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Right, time now for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today we'll be featuring the audio portion of a video called Grind by Jocko. You know what I hear? I hear the clock ticking. Time waits for no man. Life goes by, and it goes by quick. Don't waste those years. Don't waste them. Live them. Back off? Negative. Not happening. In fact, I'm stepping it up. No complacency. No complacency. No backing off. No slack whatsoever. Bring it. Fight. Fight that ticking clock with everything you got. And the earlier you get in the game and get on track, the better life you're going to have. Healthier, wealthier, stronger, smarter, better. Go through the motions. I don't really want to work out. I work out. Don't really want to get up and get out of bed. I get up and get out of bed. Don't give in to the immediate gratification that is whispering in your ear. The desire to take the path of least resistance, the downhill path, the easy path. Shut that down. Do not listen to that little voice. Instead, go through the motions. Lift the weights. Sprint the hill. Get out of bed. Get things done. And by simply going through the motions, you stayed on the righteous path, the disciplined path, which is right where you know that you belong. If you grind on Monday, and you grind on Tuesday, and you grind on Wednesday, but you chill on Thursday, and you chill on Friday, and they grind on Thursday, and they grind on Friday, so don't let it go catch you. So with every kid in America that tell me they're coming for me, you're going to work hard for it. Because I'm going to find out what the benchmarks are. I'm going to reach the benchmarks and I'm going to excel at them. You will not outwork me. I'm going to grind. I'm going to fight. I'm going to work. I'm going to press toward. I'm going to do everything in my power every single day to become a victor and not a victim. This is the part where life demands that you make a vow, come hell or high quarter, that you're willing to pay the price, where you earn your spot with effort, with sweat, with blood, with tears. It's time to test your will, your endurance, your heart, to test your limits. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. 
If you feel like you're benefiting from the show and want to show your support, you can support us on our Patreon page and a link in the show notes. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.